Hey, Basta Spear for 64K and welcome to another episode of One Man and His Machine. And today's episode is about Paul Norman, a really talented Commodore 64 creator, programmer and musician. This is his machine of choice. Let's check out the early years. Paul Norman is an American musician and video game programmer who was very successful in his craft on the Commodore 64 during the 1980s. As a kid, Paul loved listening to movie soundtracks and classical music such as the likes of Chopin or Tchaikovsky, which becomes very evident in his later work. At 13, he taught himself how to play the guitar, and by 1970, he had become a professional musician and composer and played lead guitar, among other things, in numerous bands and concerts. With the rise of the popular disco genre of music in the late 70s to early 80s, Paul found it harder and harder to find steady work and was looking for an extra means of income and creative freedom that was becoming difficult to maintain simply being a musician. 1982 rolled around and Paul bought himself a Commodore VIC-20 and taught himself basic and made a couple of simplistic games. He noticed an advert in the newspaper that same year that was looking for programmers to join a company called Synchro. They were a small business that was at the time making games for the Apple II and VIC-20 market but wanted to expand to the newly released Commodore 64 audience. Paul showed up for his interview and showed them his VIC-20 games and was hired on the spot. They gave him a Commodore 64 and asked if he knew machine language. He lied and said he did. Paul now worked at Synchro. They asked him to make a rudimentary game with a guy with a bow and arrow. Paul agreed and started teaching himself the language as well as program his first game for commercial release. About three quarters of the way through programming, Synchro was bought out by a new company called Cosme. Synchro's office location was shut down and a handful of employees were kept on as Cosme had plans to enter the video game market as well. Paul was retained and continued to work on his then almost complete first game. All further work on the game took place at his house as Cosme never had any real offices. The company was basically George Johnson's house in Pasadena who was the owner. By this time it had just ticked over to 1983 and Paul's first game was finally ready. So now we're going to have a look at all Paul's games, everything he worked on at Cosme from 1983 to 1989 all 14 of his Commodore 64 releases. 1983 saw the release of Paul's first game with Cosme titled Forbidden Forest and although the genre hadn't really been invented yet, playing this now in retrospect, it's clearly a survival horror game. Armed with simply a bow and arrow, you have to survive, kill all manner of beasts and creatures in this haunted forest. Play it at night with the lights off and pump that music and you'll be totally creeped out. The music is a real star yeah, being so relentlessly ominous to the point of sending chills down your spine and the excellent use of graphics, especially the gruesome death animations, make you want to survive as long as possible. The gameplay was simple. The music and the graphics are as cinematic as a 1983 game could possibly get. It was brilliant. The game went on to sell hundreds of thousands of copies and is still a great C64 game to track down. 1983's other gem was Aztec Challenge, which was supposed to be a simple port of an already released side-scroller on the Atari 8-bit computers. But Paul had other ideas. He decided on his own accord to completely remake the game, bigger and better and more cinematic in his own style. And thus the C64 gem was created. The game now had seven levels of unique gameplay that required razor sharp reactions to survive its entire run. Again using different camera angles for most of the levels, giving the game a kind of movie-like look and the musical score that builds itself up as you play and is totally unforgettable. This is another classic to the C64 library and should not be confused with the mediocre Atari versions. 1984's Caverns of Kafka was another example of a game being converted from an Atari 8-bit computer and Paul decided again on making it a completely new game. Unfortunately this time around it's just a bit of a mess. Just trying to navigate yourself around in this game is ridiculously bad and the whole thing just feels like an unfinished game. The music and sound effects try to save it but they simply just can't do it. I can see the attempt at trying to make some sort of Indiana Jones adventure here but the whole thing just falls apart gameplay wise. Maybe it would have been a better idea just to do a direct port. Which actually leads to his quick turnaround direct port of Slinky to the C64 in 1984 as well. Slinky was one of those knockoff games that were rampant in the early 80s. Space Invaders and Pac-Man were massive victims of this. And in Slinky's case, the arcade game Cubit was the game they were ripping off. It's actually a pretty decent little arcade romp for what it is. Nothing memorable though. In 1985 we got Trivia Monster, 
a game that Paul was not too fond of and was asked to make by the Cosme higher ups. They wanted a trivia game to compete with the extremely popular Trivial Pursuit at the time, hence Trivia Monster. I honestly think it's pretty fun if you like this type of game, with the added bonus of being murdered by a monster if you guess too many questions wrong. Beyond the Forbidden Forest was next and is obviously a sequel to the Forbidden Forest. It's a well made creepy sequel to a classic game. The foreboding atmosphere is back, as is the frantic gameplay with some clever graphical touches and some awesome monsters. It's a pretty good sequel that's not quite as good as the first but still well worth checking out if you didn't get creeped out enough by the original. And the final game for 85 was Super Huey, another game that the Cosme bosses wanted Paul to make. They wanted some sort of simulation game. He said he would only do it if he could make a helicopter simulation because he was a massive fan of the movie Blue Thunder and the TV show Airwolf. They agreed and Super Huey was made. It's a pretty good helicopter flight sim for the time and has some cool music and some interesting missions but I think the game was forgotten pretty quickly as in 1986 Microprose's Gunship came out and pretty much made all simulators at the time look like a joke in comparison. Super Huey though is still a well made game. 1986 continued Paul's new fascination with simulator style games with DEFCON 5, a strategy nuclear war simulator which was no doubt inspired by the 1983 movie War Games. I never had the instructions for this game as a kid and having a pirated copy so this game was almost unplayable but I think it could be very interesting in its ultra cold war realistic style. This was a pretty different game from Paul and is definitely worth trying if you can get your hands on some instructions that is. Super Huey 2 was next and it almost feels like a modern day DLC pack for the 80s. I found the missions actually to be a lot more fun than the original. If you like the first one you're gonna enjoy it but if not it's not gonna win you over as it's mostly the same game as before. Overall though it's still quite cool. 1987 saw Paul do some graphic work only on another Cosme title named Top Fuel Challenge which is not to be confused with Activision's own Top Fuel Eliminator They came out the same year both featuring drag racing. It was an okay I guess simulator. His other the game that year which was a full Paul Norman production however was Chernobyl, the nuclear power plant simulator. Uh, yes. And you thought some of these new games like Job Simulator were weird. This puts you in the shoes of a worker at a nuclear power plant, running the reactor and making sure it doesn't go critical. I don't even know what to say about it. <laughs> it's a bizarre yet mundanely realistic game. Or is it a game? I'm not even sure to be honest. <laughs> Only in the 80s I guess. 1988 saw two more games. First is a game he co-created called Navcom 6 The Persian Gulf Defense that is a navy cruise simulator. It kind of feels a bit like an unfinished game, it's just way too small and I simply can't recommend it. But 88's other game which Paul created solo was called The President is Missing which is a very unique detective style game where you have to figure out who has kidnapped the president and you are an investigator and you have to go through mountains of info and photos and stuff to figure it all out. It could probably be considered an investigator simulator. <laughs> it's a good game but again it's not gonna appeal to everyone and instructions are an absolute must if you attempt to play it. The game did win an award at CES 1988 for the most original game. It was followed up by a sequel also released by Cosme called Presumed Guilty where Paul contributed to graphics and story. And now on to Paul's final game for Cosme 1989 Navy SEAL, which you guessed it, is a Navy SEAL simulator, putting you in the seat of a SEAL performing various missions or training exercises. It's a decent game, nowhere near as good as something like Microprose's Airborne Ranger, but it tries. It's a collection of mini games. I do like the variety. It's pretty tough though. But interesting, Paul later said that coding Navy SEAL on the C64 was the most funny he had programming any game. So you're probably wondering, what did Paul do after 1989? Let's take a quick little brief look at his further career. Paul worked with Cosme up until 1989 and after that he decided to leave over a multitude of reasons such as money, programming burnout and wanting to work on the new PC systems of the time amongst many other things. In the early 90s he joined Tiger Media and worked on a number of games as either audio, music producer or script writer. He then moved on and worked at Sega for two years as a design consultant and is credited for working on the Genesis version of Home Alone 2. After that he moved on to website design in the late 90s and made a few sites for various companies. He also later helped design a site which teaches people how to play music. And if you want to find out more information about Paul himself you should check out his own personal website called Digitarius. It looks like it was made in the late 90s or early 2000s 
2000s. It's got a real retro vibe, which is kind of cool. It's a wealth of information on the man himself, his music, and his gaming history. Overall though, Paul's love of music and movies more than games is why his creations always had cinematic overtones. Coupled with the fact that he wasn't really a gamer himself, meant he wasn't really influenced by other designers, making his collection of games quite unique in every sense. You may be wondering what ever happened to Cosme? Well, they still exist to this day, believe it or not. They've outlived a whole bunch of really massive software companies and still around. These days though, they are more uh, what you would call shovelware distributors. <laughs> they make PC games and they also do shovelware games. You know, that bin of games for your PC that you always see at every Walmart in the corner there that you can go through and get them, buy them for like five bucks each or something. That's Cosme. They're actually one of the biggest companies in the world that produce and distribute these things. Also in the early 2000s, they decided to update a few of Paul's classic games. They made Super Huey 3 and Forbidden Forest. Just don't go looking for those. <laughs> Trust me, you're gonna be uh, very disappointed. Just pretend they don't exist and just stick to the originals. And if you're still interested about more information about Cosme, you can check them out here. And that's it. Thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. If you can like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.